Hey, hey, happy 2022. Let's make it a good one. <laughs> uh, in today's video, I'm going to show you how to sand cast um, a ring and resize it in the clay. So say you've got this fantastic shaped signet ring. It's the perfect shape. It's exactly what your client wants, except it's the wrong size. So instead of resizing it after you've cast it, you can just resize it in the clay. And I like to use um, just these ring sizes that you can buy from pretty much any jewelry supplier. So you get all of the different sizes that you, you need. Um, sometimes they come on a big ring and you'll have to cut them off the ring. Other times you get them loose like this and that's even better. All right, let's get into it. All right, so I have my toolkit here has everything in it that I need. So I'll just grab everything out. I like to keep all of my sand casting tools all in um, this artist roll. So they're all in one spot. And I need to make sure I've got every single one of them. It's particularly handy for when I'm traveling around teaching workshops. Okay, I've got all my bits. Here's my flask. So it's a flask that I've modified. So I've cut this hole in the side of it so that not only can I pour through the sand, which I call horizontal style casting, you can also cast through the side, which is vertical style casting. So this is just a regular um, ring, casting ring that you'd get with pretty much any um, casting kit. You usually don't get this hole in the side of it. It's usually solid and you'll have to cut it yourself. Um, you can buy flasks that are made perfectly for this with the hole cut in them. Um, so you've got two orientations of casting and you can buy them from Craig Dabler in the United States. He's got a fantastic website that has pretty much everything you need for all of your casting desires. And he has the flask made up perfectly for what you need. I'm also going to be using his red clay today. I've been keeping it in this big Tupperware container. I used to keep it in a bag, but um, the Tupperware container seems to be more handy. All right, that's all I'll need. So Craig makes his own clay. So it's very, very similar to Delft clay. Pretty much exactly the same as Delft clay. I've done a, um, a comparison video between the two, the two clays, the red clay and the Delft clay. The only thing I noticed that was really the big difference was that Craig's smelt a little bit more like coffee, which I know sounds a bit peculiar, but that was the biggest difference I noticed between the two. So if you can get your hands on red clay through Craig Dabler's um, website, a DIY casting, I suggest you doing it. All right, so I've just broken up that clay so that it's easier to use. When it's cut up finer, it means that it will pick up the impression much, much better. You'll get a much cleaner mold if you've got your clay cut into finer pieces. That's one of the things I like to use my ruler for. Alrighty, so the flask is in two halves. We've got the male half and the female half. So the male half has the outie, so the lip that's exposed, and the female half has the innie, the lip that is recessed. So we always start with the male half first. I like to grab a bit of cheeky clay like that, press it down with my fingers to make sure it's all nicely tightly packed against that surface, pop it over, have a little look, yep. And then I can just put a big handful in. And then I have my chasing hammer to compress it. You can use any old hammer, but I like to use the chasing hammer because it's got this big, wide, flat head on it. And also it's just a super cute hammer. Like what, you know, who doesn't need an excuse to buy another hammer? All right. Let's take off any excess clay on the back. I have some baby powder here and I'm going to dust that on the surface. That's to allow your object to come out of the clay easier. It's also to stop your two clay halves from sticking together. I'm going to be casting this ring in a vertical style. So I'm going to be pouring through this hole in the side, which means when I place my ring in, I have to think about where I'm going to sprue it. I don't really like sprueing my rings near the top or on the top of the signet. I like to sprue my rings on the shank. So that's the way I'm going to place. I'm going to put it in pretty much in the middle of the, um, the flask, but I'm just making sure the shank is facing the um, hole that I'm going to pour through. Let's push this in a little bit. 
want it in at about halfway. Now I'm going to get my lady flask, my female half of my flask, and I'm going to put her on top. And I'm going to be lining up that registration mark, which could be that giant hole, but I've actually left the original registration mark there so that I can line it up perfectly. Let's pack in some loose crumbly bits of clay, using our fingers to press it down, make sure it's nice and tightly packed, no air bubbles around our object, and then just look, put big handfuls in. You can press it with the hammer. Take off any extra clay, there we go. Now we're gonna open this up, we're not gonna screw it open, we're gonna open it up nice and evenly. And if you find it's a little bit jammed, get the back of your tweezers and wedge it into this awesome little gap that's there designed for this exact purpose of levering your flask open. Cool. Now let's get our ring out. I'm not going to sprue it yet because I'm going to do a little bit of fussing. I need to resize this ring. I need to resize it down to an N. So I'm going to place this new size right there and I'm going to press it in to about there. I don't want to press it in any deeper than the ring's impression, the impression that's already been made. Now let's close this up and open it. So lining up that registration marks. So the reason why we're doing this is so that we have a corresponding impression on the opposite side. Um, if you pull the ring out and you try and place it down manually, there is a chance that you're gonna um, misalign it. This way, by just closing and opening it, there's no misalignment and it will be perfect. So see how there's this extra bit of clay that's spilled out. We need to get rid of that. So I like to use my needle tool and I'll just cut that off. Now there's a little bit of fussing I've got to do to make these, um, these two halves nice and clean and to look like I haven't gone and done any fussing in them. So good tools to have on hand are paper embossing tools because they act like little erasers. Let's get this ring out of here and put it back in this side. And I'm just going to run it around like that. Cool. And I'm going to get the original ring and I'm going to put that back in too. Get it all nice and crispy. So not only am I making this ring um, a different size. I'm also thickening up that shank. So the original shank was quite thin. It looks like it's maybe 1.5 where this one here is 2 mil. It's a much better durable shank. The other thing is um, if your shank is too thin on your original master, your original object that you're trying to cast, your piece might not cast correctly because the shank is too thin and the metal cools much too quickly and can't get in and form your um your casting so reshanking your um your rings can be a really good idea and you can do it exactly the same way as i've just showed you to do it here except you find one of these ring sizes that are exactly the same size as the um the ring you're trying to cast and then you just thicken up that shank so that you have a wonderful thick shank casting. Not only will your um, casting fully form if it's got a two mil shank, but it means that when your client's wearing it, it's got a lot more durability and it's going to last a lot longer and it's not going to misshapen. So win-win. So I'm not sure if you guys can see, but I am just really lightly running around the ring with this uh, it's like a paper burnisher, a paper making tool or something. But um, you can also buy them as nail art tools on eBay. Paper embossing tool. Cool. That's a pretty nice impression. Let's 
Let's work on the other side. Okay, both sides are done. Let's do our sprue hole in our funnel. So I like to use my thumb to do the funnel. I learnt that trick from watching Craig Dabler's YouTube videos. He's got some really awesome, clever tricks. I like to use the back of my paintbrush to do my sprue hole because it's six millimeters in diameter and that seems to be the perfect size sprue hole for almost all castings. Anything smaller than that on a piece this size and you can have trouble with your metal cooling too fast and not enough metal getting in to um, complete your casting. So six millimeters seems to be a wide enough hole to allow enough metal to flow through. But also it's not so big that um, it's a pain in your ass to cut off. I use bolt cutters to cut my sprues off. Let's do air vents. Um, I could do two air vents of this one, which I think I will off of each corner. So I'm just gonna do a little line, like a little channel, and then I'm gonna poke all the way through. And I like to do like a little funnel on my air vent. Another line, poke all the way through. There we go. The reason why I do these little funnels is because if you put your ring down and pick it up again, they should still be open. But if it was just a pin prick, that pin prick would close up. Let's close this up and cast. Closing it up, lining up that registration mark. I'm also going to give these two clay halves a little bit of a squish together because I may have accidentally pushed them apart while I was fussing around making one ring, two rings. All right, let's go cast. All right, so I have a bunch of um, scrap silver that I'm going to be melting down, things that I've either found at the op shop or old pieces of jewelry that are pulled apart, sometimes off cuts. There's my little flask. I'm just going to spread my bricks and wedge that flask in place, making sure that the metal is going to go straight down and split evenly around that shank and fill both sides and pull together at the bottom with combined efforts to fill that casting, to fill that, that mold. Otherwise, if it's on a bit of an angle, the metal is going to want to travel down just one side of the ring and it's not going to want to go back uphill to complete the casting. So it is quite important that you get your metal splitting over that center finger part so that it can evenly fill both sides of your mold. Put your safety glasses on, it's always important. I have my size seven tip, my um, LPG gas, oxygen, and I have my regulator set up pretty high. Let's get a nice hot flame. Pretty much as hot and as hard as you could get your torch to go, which is why I have my regulator set up so high. There we go. Dominant hand on the crucible handle, non dominant hand doing the melting. So your most dexterous hand is the hand that you want to be pouring the metal with. So I say the hand that you brush your teeth with. The hottest part of the flame is about two centimeters away from the bright blue tip. Shouldn't take too long to melt down. Once you've got it fairly melted, give it a shuffle like it's a stir fry and make sure it's all mixed together. You can't see any solid bits and you get that silver to a rolling melt, which means it wants to stay in a blob, it's not sticking to the edge of the crucible. If you find the metal is particularly dirty and it has like a crust on top of it or a film, Sprinkle a tiny bit of borax on top of it and you'll clean it up. But otherwise, usually your um, crucible is seasoned with borax and that should be enough borax to clean up your metal. But every now and then you can use some particularly dirty metal and it needs just a little bit extra. 
All right, bring your crucible on over to the flask. Focusing your heat sort of at that lip where you're about to pour. And you're going to keep the flame on it as you're pouring. And you're going to pour fairly quickly. It's going to go one, two, three, down the hatch. Surely oh. And this is when you would be um, putting your extractor on and your mask so that you stay nice and safe. Let's open it up and have a look. I know, immediately after casting, you can touch your flask. Always be a little bit tentative because that silver is fairly close to the aluminium up top here. It, the aluminium could be quite warm, but the clay, the clay is not. So let's open that up and have a look. Wonderful. What a good looking casting. So it does need a little bit of filing to get the, that surface really smooth. You can sort of see a bit of texture where I've used the paper embossing tool, but it shouldn't take too much to file that off flat. Cool, because I have no stones in it, I can quench this instead of letting it burnish cool. I'll show you guys how to clean it up. There's our ring. And I like to bulk cut her off the bulk of that sprue. So find it's best to go this way, cutting through it this way. If you were to cut through the, um, the sprue this way, it tends to pinch the shank of the ring and you end up damaging your shank. So I always go this way. Close, but not too close. You don't want to take off too much metal. Cool. Okay, let's clean this up. Everybody's got something somebody else wants Everybody's got something somebody else needs Say something you don't mean, you can't take it back Let's recognize our differences now and make a pact Let's climb this mountain, strike a light to all our concerns Build a fire on this mountain Mounting concern Build a fire on this mountain See how it burns Build a fire on this mountain See how it burns With fire With fire Ultrasonic for a little bit, get it nice and cleaned up. I went for a very um, smooth, high polish finish for this one, just to show you guys you can do it. And I've set that little turquoise sapphire in the corner of that one. Bit cute. All right. Well, until next time, guys. Thank you very much for watching. Happy creating.